Now, let's talk about physical examination for these patients with gastrointestinal and nutrition problem. Inspection. During inspection, we are watching out for lesions, scarring, discolorations, especially if your patient would appear to be pale. Okay? Paleness there would signal that your patient may have possible anemia due to, due to decrease of the vitamin B12 that could possibly lead to pernicious anemia. Then we also watch out for inflammation, bruising, or striae. Your bruising or striae would signal a possible liver damage because remember, your clotting factors are being formulated in your liver. With the damage in your liver, bruising may occur. Okay? Striae may signal a rapid stretching of the abdomen and then a rapid change in the size of the abdomen. Now, we watch out for the abdominal movement. Okay? We watch out for visible strong contractions. The contractions may be undulating from the left to the right. Okay, when I say undulating, there are fine movements from the left to the right side of the abdomen. Okay, especially if we're talking about the upper abdomen. Pulsations. Pulsation may be visible in the epigastric area if we're talking about your aorta. However, if this pulsation is very strong, we need to watch out for the possibility of aortic aneurysm. Then, we inspect the abdominal contour. We watch out if the abdomen is flat, rounded, or scaphoid. Okay, the abdomen, which is flat, rounded, or scaphoid, may still be considered normal. However, if the abdomen appears to be distended or protuberant, it is usually abnormal. It may signal abnormal deposits of water, which is your ascites, or it may also signal abnormal growth in the abdomen of the patient, especially cancer or malignancy for that. Now, auscultation. When we are auscultating, remember that after inspection, we are doing your auscultation. The purpose of doing auscultation immediately after inspection is for the bowel sounds not to be altered, to prevent again the alteration of your bowel sounds. Okay, so bowel sounds or vascular sounds. We are auscultating for both the bowel sounds and the vascular sounds. Let's talk about the bowel sounds. When I am auscultating for your bowel sounds, what part of stethoscope will I be using? Will it be the bell or the diaphragm? So for your bowel sounds, it will be your diaphragm. Okay? You need to use the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Normally, the normal rate of the bowel sounds is at 5 to 20 per... Okay? Or I mean the normal rate of your bowel sound is every 5 to 20 seconds. Okay? Your, nor your bowel sound is considered to be high pitch. It is gurgling at 5 to 34 per minute or in other words every 5 to 20 seconds your bowel sounds is considered hypoactive if there are one to two bowel sounds in two minutes it is considered hyperactive if there are five to six sounds in 30 seconds it is considered to be absent if there is no sound that is heard within three to five minutes meaning upon auscultation and you did not hear any sound you could not immediately conclude that your patient is having absent bowel sounds so it, you need to wait for three to five minutes for you to conclude that indeed your patient is not having bowel sounds okay so if your patient is having hyperactive bowel sounds it is possible that your patient's gastrointestinal tract has increased peristalsis Possibly your patient is having gastric irritation. It is also possible that your patient manifests with signs and symptoms such as your diarrhea. Now, let's go to the vascular sounds. The common vascular sound that we assess for is the presence of your brewing. We assess also for the presence of murmur. We also assess for venous hums. And then we also assess for peritoneal friction. Rap. Now, brewing. Your brewing uses the bell of the stethoscope or for you to assess for the brewery, it is the bell of the stethoscope that should be used. The four areas for assessment of your brewery are your aortic, renal, iliac, and then your femoral arteries. Okay, look at the picture for this area. So these are the common sites of aneurysm. That's why we also assess for brewery in these four particular sites. Then murmurs. Then we have your peritoneal friction rub. Your peritoneal friction rub or your friction rub may be high pitch and then could usually be noticed among the liver and the spleen during your respiration. So remember, during respiration, the diaphragm goes down and there may be rubbing that occur between these organs and the neighboring organs. That's why, that's why we can hear peritoneal friction rub. Your peritoneal friction rub is also evident if there is enlargement of these organs. I'm talking about your hepatomegaly and then your splenomegaly, enlargement of your liver and enlargement of your spleen, respectively. 
Now, after your palpation, we do, or after your auscultation, I mean, we perform percussion of your abdomen. The normal sound for the percussion of the abdomen, if you are talking about air-filled organs, is your tympani. Example of an air-filled organ would be your stomach and then your small intestine. Dullness, on the other hand, would be more on the organs and then the muscles. Okay, so if you will be hearing dullness while you are auscultating for your stomach, okay, you would suspect, or while you are percussing for the stomach, I mean, again, if you will heal, hear dullness while you are percussing for the stomach, you would suspect that there is a solid mass inside the stomach. That would be a sign of malignancy. So again, the normal sound for auscultation when the body is filled with air or when the organ is filled with air would be your tympani. Okay? Now, palpation. Palpation is done last when we are doing your physical assessment of the abdomen because palpation is more likely to cause discomfort on the part of the patient and would decrease the cooperation of the patient. We usually start with light palpation before doing your deep palpation. Okay, so first we assess for rigidity. If the abdomen is rigid, we would suspect that there is an underlying inflammatory processes that is being happen, happening to your patient, that occurs to your patient, probably peritonitis. Then we have your rebound tenderness. Okay? Your rebound tenderness is also a sign of peritonitis, indicative of peritoneal irritation. So what do we mean by that? There is already an inflammation in the peritoneum. It might be a signal of a ruptured appendicitis or a spreading infection if your patient is on peritoneal dialysis. So when I talk about peritoneal dialysis or when I talk about peritonitis, I mean and rebound tenderness, the pain is experienced by the patient by the time that you release your pressure. Okay, so when you are pressing the patient's abdomen, by the time that you release the pressure and then the patient felt pain that is rebound tenderness. Okay, indicative of peritonitis. Then we have what we refer to as your Murphy sign, which would evaluate your gallbladder, common among patients with cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. So your Murphy sign is considered positive if upon inhaling or upon inhalation, your patient will be able to feel pain against the examiner's hands, which is placed over the liver borders. Again, upon inhalation, the patient will feel pain okay, against or the patient will feel pain once the liver touches the examiner's hands upon palpation. Okay, that's your Murphy sign. And then your Murphy sponge is used to assess your kidneys. Okay? Then on the assessment of your rectum, rectal assessment is usually done last, okay, along with your genital assessment, because again of the discomfort and then the privacy concerns of your patient. So the best position when you're doing this is knee chest position, left lateral position with hips and knee flex, and then standing position with the body supported. You can have either of these positions. Now, when you are doing your rectal assessment, before insertion of your finger, okay, when you're doing your digital rectal examination, you're advising your patient to perform deep breathing exercises because that will be uncomfortable on the part of your patient. So to prevent discomfort on the part of your patient, you'll be doing your, or you'll be instructing your patients to perform deep breathing. By the time that you are inserting your finger, you would tell your patient to bear down. Bearing down would allow the patient's anal sphincter to relax so that there will be no resistance when you are entering your finger or when you are inserting your finger to the patient's anus for examination. In this section, we will be discussing the diagnostic studies as they are relevant to your gastrointestinal system assessment. So first, let's talk about your serum laboratory test. Okay, let's talk about your CBC. Your CBC is your complete blood count. So what's important here is your hemoglobin and your hematocrit. One of the complications that we might encounter in a patient who is having a gastrointestinal problem is gastrointestinal bleeding. So we need to watch out for the CBC, especially the hemoglobin and the hematocrit of the patient. Okay, a decrease of your hemoglobin, hematocrit, and RBC may indicate that the patient is having severe bleeding. And with that severe bleeding, you may watch out for signs and symptoms such as your melena and your hematochesia. Also, your prothrombin time. Your prothrombin time is related to the clotting of the patient. If your patient is having problems with the liver, you will have problems with prothrombin 
time. So, if your patient is having, for example, esophageal varices, when I say esophageal varices, just think of varicosities within your esophagus. So, imagine dilated blood vessels within the esophagus. If your patient has problem with that esophageal varices due to a liver problem and then having a decreased prothrombin time, your patient is at risk of severe hemorrhage. Okay, or hemorrhagic shock, severe bleeding for that matter. So we need to watch out for the prothrombin time. If the prothrombin time is prolonged, since we are talking about time, the, the higher the time, the higher the risk for bleeding of your patient. So if they say that the prothrombin time is prolonged, your patient is at risk for bleeding. Then your triglycerides. Your triglycerides is talking about the fat absorption of your patient and the fat consumption of your patient. So this is both an indication of the diet of your patient and then the metabolism of your patient. So if your patient has increased triglycerides, meaning there could is a possibility of increased bad cholesterol compared to your good cholesterol also. Also, your patient might be taking a lot of saturated fats rather than the needs of the body in comparison to the needs of the body, hence the increase in your triglycerides. For your liver function test, you have two okay, that we commonly use, that is your SGPT and then your SGOT. An elevation of this liver function test or these enzymes would indicate damage to your liver. That is an initial sign usually if your patient is having fatty liver. Okay, if your patient is having hepatomegaly, if your patient is having liver infection such as hepatitis, or if your patient is having chronic liver disease such as your liver cirrhosis. So you would expect elevation of this enzyme, your SGPT and your SGOT. Your amylase and lipase, on the other hand, okay, are the enzymes released by your pancreas. So there is a normal range for your amylase and lipase. Beyond this normal range, you would suspect that your patient is having already pancreatitis. Okay, it may be acute pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis. So as mentioned earlier in our discussion, when I say amylase, it is an enzyme necessary for carbohydrate metabolism. Your lipase, on the other hand, is for your lipid metabolism. Take note that your pancreatic amylase is different to that of your salivary gland amylase or, or salivary amylase for that matter. Okay, your amylase and lipase here are the enzymes which are produced by your pancreas. Okay, again, if they are increased or elevated, it would indicate your pancreatic problem, okay, your acute pancreatitis, or maybe your pancreatic cancer for that matter. Then, we have other serum laboratory tests. You have your CEA, your AFP, and then your CA199. Your CAA, or your carcinoembryonic antigen, is the one which is used as a screening tool for your colon cancer. Your AFP or your alpha fetoprotein is used as a screening for your liver cancer. Your CA99 is used as a screening for pancreatic cancer. So your pancreatic cancer is among the cancers with high risk for mortality, okay? Because oftentimes it, uh, it progresses rapidly. So take note of this. I have emphasized they are screening tests, meaning they are not the gold standard for diagnosis of your cancer because that would go back to your biopsy and molecular examination of the sample cells that are taken. For the stool examinations or stool tests, one is your fecal occult blood test. Okay, another name for that is guayac test. It is referred to as guayac test because they use a certain compound named guayac okay, whenever they are doing the test. So it says fecal occult blood test, meaning it checks for the presence of blood okay, during, the, uh, during the examination. So this would be turned out positive if your patient would have bleeding, especially of that of the stomach and then the intestines. So it checks for the presence of occult blood. Now, in the past, the recommendation is for us to avoid red meat. We instruct the patient to avoid red meat, to avoid ASA or your acetyl salicylic acid, also known as your aspirin, and also to avoid the intake of NSAIDs, okay, and to avoid vitamin C ingestion when your patient will undergo the fecal occult blood test. However, these recommendations are already off as per your medical surgical nursing textbook. Okay. The purpose in the past why the ASA and NSAIDs are being stopped okay, or placed on hold is because of the risk of bleeding that this kind of medications okay, would uh, give your patient. Then, when you're doing your stool test, that's your fecalysis, okay, basically we check for the presence of ova and parasites because intestinal parasitism is also among the most common concerns encountered by our patients. Then we also check for fecal leukocytes. Okay, leukocytes are the presence of your 
WBCs, which would indicate severe infection on the part of the gastrointestinal tract. And then we also do your breath test. So for your breath test, there are two breath tests that are commonly done to assess for GI functioning. One is your uh, hydrogen, and then the other one is your urea breath test. Your hydrogen breath test is used, okay, is used to evaluate for the presence of fermenting bacteria in the gastrointestinal system. Again, hydrogen breath test is used for, to evaluate for the presence of fermenting bacteria in the gastrointestinal system. What happens here is that galactose is administered to the patient. Okay, galactose, which is a type of sugar. Okay, your disaccharide, in fact. Okay, so your galactose is given to the patient. And then if the patient has a fermenting bacteria inside her gastrointestinal tract, okay, hydrogen would go out of the breath of the patient. Okay, that's for your hydrogen breath test. On the other hand, we have your urea breath test, which is used to evaluate for your H. pylori. H. pylori, okay, will become your best friend here in GI. H. pylori, which is Helicobacter pylori, the most common causative organism for your peptic ulcer disease. Helicobacter pylori. Now, going back to urea breath test, it is used to evaluate for the presence of H. pylori. What happened here is that carbon-labeled urea is given to the patient. Okay, if there is a presence of your Helicobacter pylori inside the stomach, the urea which is given to the patient will be broken down and would release carbon dioxide because your H. pylori is capable of breaking down your urea. Okay, so urea will become carbon dioxide. Okay, and then that will be detected using the machine that they use for urea breath test. Because what happens is that the urea being administered to the patient has a specific label, okay, carbon labeled urea. Okay, they label it with a specific type of carbon in such a way that it would go out, it would be detected. Okay, then, so you need to check the carbon dioxide levels of the patient after because once there is carbon dioxide, that would indicate H. pylori is present in the stomach. Now, preparation. The following medications are placed on hold if your patient would undergo urea breath test. One is your bismuth and then the other one is your antibiotics. Okay, your antibiotics and bismuth are usually placed um, on hold for one month. And then second is that your sucralfate. Okay, sucralfate is a medication that coats your stomach for acidity. And then your omeprazole is placed on hold for one week. Okay, your omeprazole is considered to be a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor. So these medications are placed on hold for one week. Okay, the purpose of that is for the H. pylori to appear, okay, or for the H. pylori to populate for the breath test to be positive. However, okay, uh, another medication, by the way, that is placed on hold is your H2 receptor antagonist. Okay, H2 receptor antagonist, one example of which is your ranitidine, famotidine, simitidine, medication that ends with tidine. They are placed on hold for a day. Okay, however, if you can notice, you need to place on hold medications for a month, you need to place on hold sucralfate and omeprazole for a week. Okay, given this preparation, usually, Okay, the doctors recently would opt for serum H. pylori test, okay? meaning a blood test could be done, okay? a blood sample could be withdrawn, and then this will be able to detect for the presence of antibodies towards H. pylori, which would signal the presence of H. pylori infection, okay? which is more convenient on the part of the patient. And then other than that, the management for H. pylori infection would usually take months. And then most of the clinical practitioners would not allow for the medication management to be stopped for a month or even just for a week. Okay? This is risk versus benefit when it comes to your diagnostic test. Then we have other diagnostic studies. So we have your abdominal ultrasound. So when I say abdominal ultrasound, your abdominal ultrasound is actually a non-invasive test. Okay, since this is abdominal, okay, your patient will be placed on NPO for 8 to 12 hours. Your patient is advised also to reduce gas, okay, or gas-forming food intake, okay, and then by reduction of gas, that would include um, preventing, okay, or instructing your patients not to chew chewing gum before the procedure because your chewing gum would increase the gas in your abdominal contents. Then, if you are doing an evaluation of the gallbladder, a fat-free meal is actually recommended, because if you will have fat full, okay, if you have a meal full of fats prior to that, okay, your gallbladder will be widely opened, okay, or your gallbladder 
um, would have a lot of work to do to release the bile, okay, which would impede the proper visualization. And then, barium studies are done after ultrasound because we will know later on that if it's a barium study, your patient would swallow barium and this barium might uh, impede the visualization of your gastrointestinal tract for that matter. Then, we have the uh, endoscopic ultrasonography. So your EUS or your endoscopic ultrasonography is an ultrasound which is done through an endoscope. So when I say endoscope, meaning the ultrasound okay, will be inserted through the mouth of the patient and then it would go to the area that we would want to visualize. Okay, So one here is your um, uh, preparation. You need to have your moderate sedation prior to the test. Other than that, this is used to evaluate submucosal lesions. It is also used to evaluate for your barre esophagus. Okay, we'll know about barre esophagus soon. Okay, then you have portal hypertension. So when I say portal hypertension, meaning there is an increased blood pressure in the portal vein. And the portal vein is located in your liver or passing through your liver. Because of this portal hypertension, esophageal varicosities may result or your esophageal varices may occur. And your EUS is one way to evaluate that, okay? Your pancreatitis also and your cancer, if you can notice, your pancreas is located behind the stomach. So to properly evaluate it, we would need an endoscope inserted inside your patient's uh, esophagus, and then, esophagus and then it would be able to visualize your pancreas clearly. Also, this can be used for biliary tract disease because remember, your bile duct can be reached through the endoscope. Then we have your DNA testing. DNA testing is used to evaluate for gastric cancer. Okay, there is a strong familial predisposition for that. Then your lactose deficiency or your lactose intolerance for that matter. Then you have your inflammatory bowel disease and then your colon cancer. Your IBDs, such as your IBDs, when I say IBDs, this refers to your ulcerative colitis and then regional enteritis. So these diseases have strong familial predisposition. Okay, so as your colon cancer, so there is a strong familial predisposition, hence DNA testing is recommended for this patient. Then we have your computed tomography or your CT scan. So your CT scan is used okay, in GI for inflammatory conditions. Prior to CT scan, you need to know the pregnancy status of your patient. If your patient is less than 20 weeks pregnant, you might need or the physician might need to think twice before having CT scan. Okay, so um, usually if you're doing CT scan of other organs or other parts of the body, um, we can have our patients wear a lead shield. However, in this case, since we're doing abdominal CT scan, okay, lead shield would not be much of help to us because the area that we would want to visualize is the abdomen of the patient. Okay, then uh, CT scan is also used to evaluate the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, and the pelvic organs for structural abnormalities. Other than that, we need to assess for allergy, especially if our patient will undergo CT scan with contrast. Take note, CT scan could be done with contrast or without contrast. So if your patient would undergo CT scan with contrast, you need to evaluate for the presence of allergy. Okay? And if your patient would have allergy to seafoods because the main contrast that we use is iodine, you need to inform the physician. Do you need to cancel CT scan? That would depend to the physician can CT scan pursue okay, with contrast even if the patient is allergic to the, uh, to the contrast medium? The answer to that would be yes, okay? but that would depend on the evaluation of the physician. So even if the patient is allergic to the contrast, the CT scan may go on as long as you have informed the physician, the physician knows this, and then you can prepare the emergency medications in case a systemic allergic reaction would occur. Okay, leading towards your anaphylactic shock if not halted. So, what are the medications that you need to prepare if ever you would anticipate allergy for your patient? One is your hydrocortisone, which is a steroid used to help your allergy. And then you also have your epinephrine. Remember, your epinephrine is your drug of choice for anaphylaxis. Okay, epinephrine for that matter. You also need to prepare your intubation set in case the patient would have respiratory arrest or failure. Now, kidney function. If the patient would undergo CT scan with contrast, you need to evaluate for kidney function. What laboratory test is used to evaluate for kidney function? That would be your, yes, creatinine. 
Okay, so creatinine. Now, if your patient has increased creatinine levels, okay, you need to have the following preparation. You need to administer IV sodium bicarbonate, okay, one hour before and six hours after upon the order of the physician. So the purpose there of your sodium bicarbonate is to neutralize the acid. Next, you have your NAC or your flumosil. Your flumosil would help extract the contrast later on. Okay, NAC is so uh, N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine. And then you have hydration. The purpose of hydration is to flush out the contrast out of the body. Okay, so if there is impairment in kidney function, this management is usually employed if ever your patient really needs to undergo CT scan with contrast. But as a nurse, you need to inform the physician and you need to make sure that the physician knows that the allergy is positive and then the creatinine is increased because these are warning signals for the physician to rethink if ever the test needs to continue or not. Then we have your magnetic resonance imaging. So when I say magnetic resonance imaging, this can produce 3D images of the body. Okay, so it uses magnetic wave, waves, I mean it uses radio waves. It, uh, it is very important to evaluate for your blood vessels, especially for exploring aneurysm. Also to evaluate for the presence of abscess and then fistula and then neoplasms. However, it is contraindicated. This is a complete contraindication. If your patient has a pacemaker, remember the magnetic field in your MRI is very strong. It can pluck out the pacemaker out of the patient's chest. Also, if the patient has metal implants and then aneurysm clips, the tendency for aneurysm clips is to use metallic substances. Okay, so if you have aneurysm clips, the purpose of that is to relieve the aneurysm of your patient. So you better not expose your patient in magnetic resonance imaging or else the aneurysm clip will be pulled out from your patient's brain or wherever the aneurysm is. Then cochlear implants, cochlea, that's for your patients with problems in inner ear. And then you have your foiled back or foiled back patches. When I say foiled back patches, an example of this is your nitroglycerin patch. If you would search for the picture of nitroglycerin patch, you would notice that one side of which is made up of made up of foil or aluminum. Okay, so if you are having this aluminum, the tendency is for your patient to be burnt because of the aluminum that could be acted on by the magnetic field of the MRI, okay? By the way, it's also the same class when you're doing your shock or administering your defibrillation to your patient. If there is a nitroglycerin patch or any patch made of foil on the patient's chest, you need to remove the patch, okay? Because this patch might also cause burn on the part of your patient. Then if your patient is undergoing MRI, that would be an NPO of 6 to 8 hours prior to the procedure. Because if not, okay, the uh, food contents or the food remnants may be visualized during the CT scan or MRI of your abdomen. Okay, so this is an MRI machine. If you can notice, this is the time we're in we need to assess for claustrophobia because our patient would be enclosed in a closed space. Okay. And then on that, you need to check, you need also to educate your patient that there will be presence of knocking sounds. So when I say knocking sounds, okay, they might hear knocking sounds inside the machine. So you tell them that they can use headsets, okay? That is if there's a modern MRI machine that has a headset compatible to which. And then um, take note also, class, that uh, your patient may be able to communicate inside the machine because there is a built-in microphone there that allows them to communicate to the healthcare team. The entire duration for a CT scan MRI is 60 to 90 minutes. Okay, 60 to 90 minutes. That's why if the condition does not warrant for this class, we do not usually opt for the use of MRI. You don't say that because MRI is 3D, that is always the best option that your patient may have. Okay, your patient may opt for other options, okay, or as the doctor deem necessary. Such as, for example, if we're dealing with stones, okay, in the ureter, the usual uh, diagnostic test that we would order for the patient is CT stonogram, okay, so it's a CT scan. Then you have your positron emission tomography, which uses your radioactive substances, okay, which decay quickly. So your positron emission tomography checks the part of the body that rapidly metabolizes or rapidly acts on the radioactive substances which are released. Okay, these hot spots are usually areas for cancer or usually areas of neoplasm. Okay, for your uh, specific types of cancer. 
looking at the CT scan images, I think the red spots there are emphasized on the liver. Okay, that's an emphasis on the liver. Okay, now we will discuss other diagnostic tests on the succeeding uh, recorded lecture. Thank you very much for your kind attention on this one.